ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋ ಮಾಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯುರ್ಮೃತ ಗಮಯ ಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿ ಓಂ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಅನ್ ಟು ಲೈಟ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡೆತ್ ಅನ್ ಟು ಇಮಾರ್ಟ್ಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಓಂ ಪೀಸ್ 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 ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ and it's nice to be back <laughs> today there's a reason why i'm sitting here usually i stand up and speak that's how i like speaking um but what i'm going to do today is is this evening is going to be different i'll speak about something that cannot be spoken about from a pulpit from a lecture it it is not a sermon it is not a philosophy lecture i'm going to speak about the highest non dual truth from the highest non dual text available to us the ashtavakra ashtavakra sanghita i never done this earlier i thought let's try it this is the book which sri ramakrishna taught only swami vivekananda and uh, uh, swami vivekananda at first refused to read it and sri ramakrishna would say just read it for me for my sake and later on swami vivekananda praised it to the skies and in fact in some of the highest teachings of swami vivekananda later on when you uh, read about some of the teachings he gave in california in the second visit it looks like lucid english but he is quoting directly from this if you know the original text you'll see he's just translating directly from this there's a difference in this text there are texts which talk to the heart spiritual teachings which talk to the heart to to the emotions there are spiritual teachings which talk to the mind to the intellect and there are these teachings which bypass both which talk directly to the god within us here it's a call to the divine within us our true nature directly you see it doesn't have arguments it doesn't have nicely reasoned much of logic coming to an inescapable conclusion which you find in many vedantic uh, teachings which are so exhilarating but here it goes beyond that it goes straight to the truth and tells you that the central truth that you are none other than god tat tvam asi that thou art again and again and again that's just one thing it tells you it's not intellectual in that sense reading it is like meditating holy mother said once to a devotee if you cannot meditate on sri ramakrishna it's enough to look at his picture if you just sit there and look at his picture it's enough if you cannot have nirvikalpa samadhi you can read this book read it for an hour or two hours it's as good as the most intense meditation for hours and hours together it's difficult it's difficult because it's the most profound thing that has ever been put into words i'm telling you i have what i have read in the sacred literature of the east and the west there's nothing that compares to this it's like looking straight at the sun so that is uncomfortable all of the texts the scriptures of different religions including vedanta they are all like looking at the moon the moon is also sunlight but reflected cool and refreshing and inspiring and beautiful looking straight at the sun is uncomfortable but we'll try to do that today you you look at a mirror you see your face staring back at you look at this mirror you will see the face of god you'll see the face of god i remember when i went and spent some time in the himalayas uh, every time 
I would go with only one book. I did study other books which came across my path at that time, but I went with only one book, this book. I have referred to it occasionally, at times, but I've never taught or given a complete talk or a session based on this. So this is the first one. I'm rolling it out. They call it a beta test or something in an IT language. So we're going to do this. Now, what you're going to do this do now is, listen, you must. Understand, good. But really what I would like all of us to do is, is to recognize, is to appreciate it, is to see that it is the truth. Just notice that it is the truth. Just recognize it within yourself in your life. Not something to be practiced. Oh no, this is far beyond that. Not even something to be realized, it's just something to be noticed and... There are books which are for practice, there are books which are for understanding, there are books for inspiration, books of philosophy and theology. There are books which, which are direct for, for direct realization. They tell you the truth straight away. So that's enough of an advertisement for the work. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful stuff. So I will speak to you, but I, the book speaks directly to the reality within us, not to the mind. If you give, if you give it to the mind, the mind will try to take, take it. If you listen to it and Automatically, the reaction is to give it to the mind. If you give it to the mind, one of two things will happen. Either the mind will say, yes, I understand it. Or the mind will say, no, I don't get it. Both are equally useless. Both are equally useless. Are, that's not what this book is meant for. So, go, this book speaks to something within you which is beyond the mind which looks upon the mind, which is eternal, in which the mind appears and goes. So focus intently, but also relax. You're not, if you miss a few words here and there, if, if, you're, if you want to dive deep within yourself, do that. That's what the session is for, for. Because all that will be said here is just one thing. Now, today I'll share here four verses. Four verses from this book. Uh, listen carefully and don't do anything else. Right? No mobiles, no pictures, cameras, things like that, no. Just listen. Four verses where the great sage Ashtavakra is having a dialogue with the emperor Janaka. Both of them are enlightened souls. So we shall share, we shall listen in on their dialogue. This ver this. Um, Chapter is called Four Ways to Dissolution. Each verse ends with Thus dissolve into the infinite. Thus dissolve into the infinite. You don't have to actually dissolve into anything. You just have to recognize a truth and that is dissolution into infinity. And there are four verses which will come. Just four verses. Each one is an independent, direct indication pointing out to the reality within us. But there is a progression also. The first one, next one is deeper, the third one is even deeper, and the fourth one is a kind of consequence of all those three. Let's see. So the great sage Ashtavakra is saying, we'll start with the first one now. At the end of this exercise, it's an exercise, it's not a lecture. At the end of this exercise, then I'll throw it open. And you'll have questions, reactions, comments. All right. I'll chant the verse, I'll tell you the meaning, then I shall, we shall all together meditate upon it. I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Ashtavakravaja nate sangosti ke napi king shuddhastyaktum ichasi sanghata vilayam kurvan Evam eva layam vraja. What does it mean? You are never attached to anything in life. O oh, pure one, what are you trying to give up? Dissolving in this way the body-mind complex 
or merging in this way the body-mind complex, dissolve into infinity. I'll repeat again. You are never ever attached to anything in this universe. Oh pure one, what are you trying to give up? Merging the body-mind complex in this way, thus dissolve into infinity. What does it mean? We are never attached to anything in this world. This is a typical style of Ashtavakra. He'll tell you the most astonishing, radical things. And yet if you meditate upon it, a great realization dawns upon us that he's just telling us the truth about ourselves. Think about it. Everything passes away. Look at the places you have lived in from your childhood till now. Places you have lived in, you have played in, the schools, your college, your house, and the places you have visited, countries you have seen. How it has changed from place to place to place. The people you have known, not only in this life, Hindus, Buddhists, we believe in many lives. So many fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers and husbands and wives and children and grandchildren, friends and enemies, people you have been indifferent to, life after life, they have all gone. They have all gone. Positions, the most treasured and the most insignificant, all come and gone. Everything that is now here, today, including this day, the setting sun is telling us just one thing, it will go. Vivekananda says, kings die and paupers die. The most learned die and the most ignorant die. The richest people die and the poorest die. The strongest die and the weakest die. Everyone, everyone dies. All of us, our bodies will die one day. We know that. But yet this is not what it is saying. This is the interesting thing about Ashtavakra. That is the surprising thing. Buddhism, Vedanta, in fact, all of these spiritual philosophies, they continuously tell us that the world is impermanent. Everything is impermanent, everything changes, everything goes. We are being told again and again and again. True. But there is another side of the equation which Vashtavakra is pointing out. If everything has gone, is going away and will go away, what it means is that nothing sticks to you. You are not attached to anything. You are not attached to anything in this universe. You see, the impermanence of things means that one, you, who are experiencing these things, you are not attached to anything. They come and go. You will say, that's not true, Swami. I have got so many attachments. I am attached to my wealth, my house, my, my children, my, my, my enemies. What would I do without my enemies? <laughs> How could I pass my time? My opinions, my political views, my career, I'm attached to so many things. My body, my health, my youth, I'm attached to so many things. No, you are not. Think of the greatest possible attachment this world can ever see. The attachment of a mother for her young baby, a new child. A mother with her young baby, the greatest possible attachment. The child occupies her thoughts and emotions all day long. And yet every night when she falls asleep, if she does, I am, I am, I am given to understand it's not easy to fall asleep if you have a new child in the house. But when she, when she finally does fall asleep, happily, peacefully, gratefully, she slips into the unknowingness of deep sleep. Where... Where the world, the, her most precious baby, her own body, everything is forgotten in deep sleep. And she goes into that state without hesitation. She doesn't think, oh, I'm leaving my baby behind, what will happen? No. I'm not saying that you should not be attached. Ashtavakra is telling us you are not attached. You are not attached to anything. It is the mind which develops attachments. I want this, I want this to stay. I want that person to stay. I want these circumstances, this wealth, this health, this place, this environment. I want this to continue. This is the mind thinking. Yet beyond the mind, the Atman, the witness, you, the being consciousness, you are not attached to anything. Not even to the mind itself. The mind itself disappears in deep sleep. You are not attached to anything. 
William Blake, he who grasps a pleasure kills the wing doth kill the winged life. He who grasps to himself, I think he said a pleasure or something, or, or, or the or the moment, doth kill the winged life. But he who kisses the passing moment as it flies lives forever in eternity's sunshine. When you kiss the moment as it flies, and let it go. You live forever in eternity's sunshine. How beautiful. William Blake. You see, the moment you grasp something, we think we are holding on to something, some person, some, um, some possession, some idea. The moment I grasp, you know what is happening? I'm also caught. I'm also caught. As I'm holding on to this, if you now start dragging the, the uh, lectern, I'll be dragged along with it because I'm caught now. Sri so Ramakrishna's story about the classic, you know, the classic case of addiction. There's a man who was standing by the riverside and uh, there was a flood and something which looked like an expensive rug was being swept away in the flood waters. And this man jumped into the river and swam hard to get grasp the rug. And when he came near it, he found it was a bear. A bear being swept along. And the bear, of course, gives you a hug. A bear hug. And it caught hold of him. And the people who were standing on the side, the river bank, they said, they saw this man being swept away. He said, let go of the rug. In Hindi, kambal ko chhordo. Let go of the rug. You'll be swept away. And the man shouted back. I have, let gone, I have let go of the rug. The rug doesn't let go of me. <laughs> that's attachment. That's addiction. But what Ashtavakra tells you is, that's also at the level of the mind. Really, you are not attached to anything. In Sanskrit, it is called asanga, asangatvam. Reflect upon it. What has stuck to you in life? Nothing. You say, bad habits, Swami. Bad habits were not there earlier. You developed it. Even today when you go into deep sleep, not there. It's only when you wake up, the mind comes up. The habits are in the mind and the body. When you become aware of them, then you're aware of them again. Even there also you're not stuck to it. You, the witness of the mind, is not stuck to anything in the, in the body and mind. Consider this. That which we consider ourselves to be, this body and this mind, body-mind complex. Are, is this part of you or not? You think this is who I am. Yet consider this. Two things. If you can see them separately, they are not part of each other. They are separate. For example, a person, if you want to know whether he has got dentures or are they original teeth, the only way you can know is if you one day go to suddenly to the house and see that person giving you a very toothy, a, a, a toothless, beautiful, grandfatherly smile and the teeth are sitting in a solution separately, then you know those are the two separate beings, that person and the dentures. So to know whether something is separate, the two things are two independent, different entities, you need to see one without the other. Isn't that true? You need to see them separately. When the person is there wearing the dentures, you cannot know whether they are their dentures or real teeth. You need to see them separately. Now, this body and this mind, is it you? Is it even a part of you? We would, all, we would say that, yeah, that's, that's who I am. And so all the problems of body and mind are my problems. And yet, every day when we fall asleep, when we dream, we completely forget this body and we forget the waking world. That I am safe and sound in my bed and this is my waking world, my whole bio, bio, bio data. All that is gone and a dream world comes before us. You might say, oh Swami, we're just dreaming. But what Vedanta points out is, look at your experience in the dream. You are there in the dream. It may be a dream, it may be false, but you are experiencing it. And your experience of, of a self, a conscious self, continues without any reference to the waking body, which is dreaming, which is sleeping in, on, in bed. 
The body of the waking state, this body, is sleeping in bed. You are having a conscious experience of a dream, which proves to you, you as a conscious being can continue without reference to the physical body. You're seeing the denture and the person separately now. You are not the body. Though it, you are acting through the body, you are using the body, the body is there, you are not it. You are not attached to it permanently. The mind with which we identify ourselves completely. As we go into deep sleep, the mind shuts down, no dreams. No dreams. Absolute quiet. You say, I slept like a log. Sometimes you do that in Vedanta classes. <laughs> on the pretext of meditation. Huh? I slept like a log. Which means no mind, no dreams. Yet who slept? Vedanta says, you are still there. Because the mind is not there, there are no experiences. You require the mind and the senses and the body for experiences. Or at least the mind for experiences. No mind, mind is shut down. Hence you do not have conscious experiences. Consciousness without experience. Consciousness without object. A blankness, a darkness. But yet it means you were there. If you are not there, then who slept? How can you say that I slept soundly? What was it that slept soundly? What was it that experienced sound sleep? You are that which experiences the presence of the mind. You are that which experiences the absence of the mind in deep sleep. This is what yogis do. They do we, do we, we fall asleep. They fall asleep consciously. They strip away the external world by quietening the senses. They quieten the body down to lose awareness of the body. They quieten the mind down, isolating the consciousness which is behind, behind the mind. Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Tada Drashtu Swarupi Avasthanam, the third sutra, where the witness, the infinite consciousness which is the witness, remains in its own nature, in Samadhi. Proving then, you are not even the mind. Even the mind is not attached to you. You are not attached to the mind either. You are not attached to this body. You are not attached to the mind. The body is there. The exper you experience the changing body. The birth, the birth and the babyhood and the childhood and the teenage and the growth, youth, middle-aged, disease, decay, old age, death. All of this the body will undergo, not attached to you. Says, oh pure one, what are you trying to give up? Very interesting. That one which is the witness of body and mind is pure. All impurity is in the world, in the body, in the mind. Not in that which is the witness of the mind. You are that which is the witness of the mind, you are forever pure. What are you trying to give up? Meaning thereby, you see, all our efforts to improve ourselves, to make ourselves more spiritual through prayer, through meditation, through good deeds. Either we are adding something to ourselves. I need some virtues. I want to be selfless. I need to be more uh, integrated. I need to be more um, loving or kind, unselfish. I'm adding virtues to make myself better. Or I'm getting rid of things which I think are very bad for me, non-spiritual. I am very restless. I give up the restlessness, quieten the mind and body down. Thereby thinking I'm improving myself. Here it's telling you, you are absolutely pure and perfect. That vast perfectness which you already are. You need not add anything to that because something that is perfectly pure, if you add anything to it, no matter how good, you're making it impure. Something that is perfectly pure, there's nothing impure to give up there also. What are you going to add? What are you going to give up? Ashtavakra has the danger of being misunderstood. It does not mean you're going to give up your spiritual practices. Practices to make your life better will continue. Practices to make your life better will continue. Ramakrishna asked his master Totapuri, You are an enlightened soul. You are enlightened. Why do you meditate so much every day? And Totapuri said, Here he was a wandering monk. And he was completely naked, but he had this pot, water pot. And he said that, Look at this water pot, brass. If I do not polish it, it will lose its shine. 
in the same way enlightenment of course but the mind has to be immersed in the reality which the self is i am brahman it has to be immersed in that every day so that it retains the light of enlightenment it retains the shine of enlightenment of course sri ramakrishna had a come back to that also he said ah but if the pot were gold you wouldn't have to polish it <laughs> i think there why he was distinguishing between an avatar and a, and an ordinary jeevan mukta what are you trying to add to yourself you you need not add anything to yourself the atman you need not get rid of anything that one which is the witness of body and mind which is come completely unattached to the world to the people to the events to the body even to the mind even thoughts ideas memories i've told you the story of the the philosopher and the monk i told this earlier uh, it's a true thing which i saw a great philosopher uh, very respected he told me once that he had a mild stroke and he was forgetting mind was not as quick as it was and he was forget it's like a multimillionaire who is losing everything suddenly on wall street and it becomes a pauper next day so all that he has worked for all his life it's gone in a flash suppose how depressing that is and the philosopher was saying i am so depressed i am i am feeling great depression i am feeling uh, miserable sorry and it's understandable it's understandable exactly the same thing i saw with one crucial difference a monk whom i revered very much he has passed away his name is uh, ram maharaj swami mokshadananda ji he was he was our acharya at the training center uh, briefly very briefly at that time also he was very old and uh, he was very unwell he used to have oxygen given to him 8 9 hours a day never saw him unhappy twinkling eyes always one of the wisest people i've seen i mean if you i don't know if the comparison is good but i'll make it anyway like in star wars you see yoda <laughs> something like that <laughs> yes he even spoke like that little bit <laughs> i used to go to him with questions about vedanta so one day i went to him he was one of the greatest scholars we had in the order now look same thing we went i went to him one day towards the end of his life with a question and he thought and he thought and he thought and he could not remember the answer a philosophical question and he said now i cannot remember it's all going away exactly what the philosopher said this monk is saying exactly what the philosopher said but the next part is the crucial difference i cannot remember now it's all going away and then with a broad smile and the same twinkle in his eyes he said let it go its task is done he has found something within himself which is independent of mind and body it's there right now within us we are that thus dissolving the body and mind thus thus merging the body and mind dissolve yourself into infinity dissolving the, or merging the body and mind does not mean committing suicide i am completely unattached with body and mind i don't need the body and mind let me kill myself no not suicide trying to stay alive trying to kill oneself both are signs of attachment to body and mind one swami bhuteshananda the 12th president of our order was visiting our ashram deoghar and the swami in charge there asked him um how do you look upon life now swami and he said he had a slow drawl he said i neither desire to live nor to die he was 98 years old at that time neither desire to live nor to die the life of the body will take its own course why are we so concerned with it we are not attached to it when you are not attached to the body and mind it takes its own course this is called the merging of the body and mind this is called dissolution into the infinite i am one with the infinite billions of bodies and minds are coming and going this one also will go in its own way why worry so much about it why so worried about it this this verse in one sanskrit word asangatvam asanga means detached detachment non attachment this verse what we read just now it can be summed up in one sanskrit word asangatvam asangatvam means non attachment remember 
Non-attachment is taught as a practice. That you should not be attached to anything. Here, Ashtavakra is not teaching you a practice. It's telling you a fact about yourself. Your highest nature is non-attached. All phenomena arise in your consciousness, are experienced in your consciousness, disappear into your consciousness. The consciousness is not attached to any of it. The light which shines upon this room, people come and go, the light illumines everything, not attached to it. When the person goes away, the light doesn't go away with it. When the person comes here, light, light has not come here. Light doesn't stick to the person or to the things. It just illumines. You are that light which illumines everything that happens in your life. Asangatvam. All we are called upon to do, note it. That unattached reality within us has no problems. Has absolutely no problem. You are completely forever free of problems. You can relax. That means, Swami, shouldn't I meditate? All the efforts I've been making. Certainly, meditation is done at the level of the mind. Meditate. Good works are done at the level of the body. Go on doing good works. Improve your life. Yes, you can go on. But remember, that which is a witness of the improved life, that is completely unattached to the improved life also. It experiences it. It's a good thing. It's a good project, a hobby to make a better life, a more spiritual life. Yes. I am not even joking. From the point of view within yourself, from the level at which you are none other than God, the spiritual efforts that you are making in your life, it's a nice hobby. You are, Vivekananda said, what is all that, all that we do in life? He said, you, can, you are polishing the mirror. All that we can do in life is to polish the mirror. When you have polished the mirror enough, look into it, you will see God. Even the mirror you are not attached to. The mind which is now listening to this, which, which likes this idea, not even not attached to that mind either, it appears to you. The mind which does not get this idea, is uneasy about this idea. You are not attached to that either. It's just a mind. You can see what crazy stuff I used to think in the Himalayas. There was a monk who lived in the hut next to me, a very old, very wise monk. He asked me what I was reading. I was staying in and begging for my food and meditating and reading this book. So he called me and he, I showed him this book. And he gave, gave me another book. Vishnu Shahasranam, a thousand names of Vishnu, a very devotional text. He said, read this with that. Otherwise you would run the risk of going out of your mind. <laughs> Always balance it. Now we shall go into the second one. This, just, this is just the opening theme. Now we are going to go deeper. One word take away from this verse, Asangatvam. The truth, the reality that I am is non-attached, is unattached to the phenomena which it experiences, including this person, this little life, this person which you th we think we are, yet not that. It's a page in the book of li many, many lives. Each life is a page which you turn over and you get into another life. The Atman, the pure consciousness, is experiencing this book of the universe. You're not attached to them. That particular page is not you. It's something that you have read, you have experienced. Let's go deeper. The second verse. Udeti bhavato vishwam vari dheriva budbudaha eti gyatvevam eti gyatvekamatmanam Evam eva layam vraja. All right, the second one goes deeper. The entire universe arises in you like bubbles in an ocean. Entire universe arises in you like bubbles in an ocean. Knowing thus the oneness of the self, the entire universe is one reality. 
you enter thus into dissolve thus into infinity what a beautiful point uh, what, what a beautiful insight the entire universe which we experience it arises in you like bubbles arise in the ocean like the waves in the in the pacific ocean out there in santa barbara you see when you say i'm detached from everything i'm not attached to everything the impression which comes is i am a consciousness which is experiencing a universe out there which i'm separate from it comes and goes i'm like a beam of light in which motes of dust are floating that's the experience that's the understanding which comes to us separateness look at the ocean waves thousands and thousands of waves they are all separate from each other they are all different from the point of view of a wave there are thousands of others like me big and small from the point of view of bubbles there are millions of bubbles in the bubbles in the ocean but this entire experience of the universe where is it ashtavakra tells us it's not a separateness you are detached not from something separate from you this entire thing which you are experiencing and which you are detached from non attached to it it comes and goes it comes and goes within you it's not apart from you the universe is you we are the universe which we experience not poetically as a matter of fact think about it everything that we have experienced in life till now every person every incident every book that you have read what we have learned what we have suffered what we have enjoyed all of that has been in our consciousness have we ever ever experienced anything outside consciousness is it even possible it's tautological it's logically impossible it's logically impossible to experience outside consciousness you cannot whatever has been experienced has been experienced in your awareness in your experience that which is experienced in your consciousness is not separate from it it arises in your consciousness is shines in your consciousness disappears back into your consciousness it is you yourself the universe arises in you like bubbles in an ocean udeti bhavato vishvam the universe arises from the like bubbles arise in an ocean exist there disappear back into it so what gyatva evam gyatva ekam ekatva atmanam gyatva ekam atmanam know thus the oneness of the self the entire universe is one you see all the bubbles and the ocean the waves the tsunami waves the little waves they are all one with the ocean it's not that there is an ocean in which there are separate things called the waves the waves are the ocean the waves have no existence apart from the ocean they come up in the ocean they dance about in the ocean and they go disappear back into the ocean every person you have met every act that you have done everything that we say everything that we think everything that we want everything that we do not want those we love those we do not li- like all of that is literally us is the consciousness that we are we are one with the universe the first reaction of this would be a feeling of oneness with everything and everybody you're comfortable with everybody tremendous love comes and this love is not directed at one person it's not directed at one thing it is infinite love for you you make up your mind that i am in love with everybody with everybody without any restriction it doesn't matter if if they are older than you younger than you ma- men women animals birds insects people you hate people you dislike no more hate and dislike deep within there can be no hate will the right hand hate the left hand for what vivekananda says no praise or blame can be where praiser praised blamer blamed are but one the universe is one the holy mother's last teaching simple words before she she passed away masharda she said to her attendant the world is your own there is no one who is not your own learn to make the world your own 
Vivekananda says if sometimes you felt this urge of stretching out your arms and trying to embrace the universe, you have felt the truth. It is you yourself. <laughs> not one atom in this universe, not one insect, not one life here is different from us. It's we are ourselves, our one life, one consciousness in this. It's a joy. It, it's the enormous creativity of that consciousness which comes up in all these ways. You are tasting yourself. Ashtavakra elsewhere he says, Mai ananta maham bodho ashcharyam jiva vichaya udyanti gnanti khelanti pravishanti swabhavata I am an infinite ocean of consciousness. In me, all these beings, including this one, they come up like little waves. Udyanti, they come up. Khelanti, they play with each other. Gnanti, they fight with each other. Pravishanti swabhavata, they merge back into me again. Ashcharyam jiva vichaya, the, the most strange beings, the, the, the most wonderful things are these creatures which come up. Ashcharyam jiva vichaya. I remember the Swami, one Swami in the Himalayas who taught us this. I would sit under at his feet and listen. And this particular verse, when he's saying, in a very childlike way, he would say it. Udyanti, they come up, Khelanti, they pl play with each other, the waves are playing with each other in me, the ocean. He says, I love you, I love you. Gnanti, I'll fight with you, I'll divorce you. <laughs> Pravishanti. And he says, they disappear back into me. We are one with everybody. The consequence of this, Vivekananda says that eternal love and service free. Eternal love and service free. There are, I was reading body language, there are some signs, you know. And he says, people who do this, and speaking, they have this inclusiveness, this body language which shows inclusiveness. And they've pointed to an example, they showed videos, they showed the Mac person who does this almost all the time, continuously, unselfconsciously, is the Dalai Lama. You know, he's trying to embrace everybody. It feels a natural oneness with everybody. These realized saints are like mirrors. They reflect us back unto ourselves. They're completely empty themselves. They include the entire universe within themselves. There is no individualized self there. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's, all, all that, that's what truly we are. Notice it. Wherever have you ever experienced anything in the universe outside your own awareness? Nowhere. This whole verse, one Sanskrit word. Ekatvam, oneness. First one, don't forget. Asangatvam, non-attachment. That non-attachment deepens into ekatvam. Why that non-attachment is important, now you can understand. What prevents us, what separates us from everybody else is this attachment to the particular. One body, one life, one mind, one set of opinions, one particular life. When you, when you clearly see, you don't even have to detach yourself, you clearly see that this appears in one consciousness. It is, uh, I'm not attached to it, it comes and goes. I experience it. When you are Unattached, when you see yourself, when you see the natural detachment which you possess all the time, the most miserly of persons attached to all, you know, Scrooge, with all his wealth, completely detached from wealth. Ashtavakra will tell you he is the most detached person in the a, a great monk. The moment that person goes into deep meditation, or okay, Scrooge wouldn't go into meditation, the moment he goes into deep sleep, all the wealth is forgotten. So, we're completely unattached from the particular, then only we can recognize we are one with the universal. So that next step is oneness, ekatvam. You're one with the universe. That, that pure consciousness 
unattached to the particularities of life, the phenomena which come in our particular life, unattached to that, experiencing it, is one with the universal consciousness. You are Brahman, in which the universe shines. You are the same person in that body and mind experiencing the thrill of racing along. <laughs> and that person is the same person sitting here listening to Vedanta and trying to meditate and understand uh, what is being pointed out here. One consciousness. Only bodies and minds are different. One wave is, is breaking into surf there. Other wave is uh, rolling along in another part of the ocean. One water, one ocean. Let's go deeper. Even deeper than this. The third one. Recognizing this infinity, what it said, recognizing that oneness of this universe, which you are, dissolve thus into infinity. Now you, this in, individual being is dissolved into infinity. You see that you are one with infinity. That particular life does not matter to you anymore. Let it lead a wonderful life of service and calmness and beauty and peace. And one day it will pass away. Fine. It makes no dent to you. You are the infinite. What does one body and one little life make? You are that. Right now. Ashtavakra says, just no notice it. Just recognize it. Third one. Oh, this is even deeper. <laughs> All right. Pratyaksham apyavastutvad Vishwam nastyam aletvai Rajju sarpa eva vyaktam Evam eva layam vraja <laughs> What did he say earlier? You are detached from the entire universe first. Second, the entire universe is in you. Third, the entire universe is not in you. Now he's saying, Pratyakshamapi, even though it is experienced, you see it, you hear it, you smell it, you touch it, taste it, you think about it, you understand it, you struggle with it. Pratyaksham, it is experienced all the time. Yet, because it is, he says, avastu, because it is inherently empty. We'll come to that. It is, in Sanskrit, what is called mithya, false, an appearance. Because of that, there is no universe within you. Amale tvai, in you the stainless, the pure, in which there is no blemish, in the blemishless the entity, in the, the reality which is you, that no universe exists in you. It appears in you. Look, they're not denying it. They're not denying you actually see the universe, you experience the body, you have a life, you experience it. Not denying it. They're just saying it's not real. It's an appearance. Then, Rajju Sarpa Iva Vyaktam. It appears like a, that famous snake in the rope. It appears like a serpent in a rope. The rope is mistaken for a serpent. You, the infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, you. You are mistaking your real nature for this world. This world is none other than Brahman. This world is none other than you. You do not know that. You know, you know it to be a universe and people and a life of suffering and strife. Ambition and success and failure, the little stories of each of our little personal lives. That's what we know it as. Pratyaksham api avastutvat. Though we see it, it's not real. That Swami under whom I used to study this, I have told this story earlier again, I think I'll, I'll repeat it, but it, it's pertinent here at this point. He was in Gangotri, the Ganges is flowing past the Ganga, narrow and fast and 10,000 feet in the Himalayas and this television crew comes to take a picture, to take a video of the, of, the, of the Ganga and because the Swami had not seen television uh, they said we'll show you TV and they put a tel television in front of him they cranked up a generator, focused the camera on the river and the Swami told us in uh, Hindi he told us Sab dikta hai matma ji, pani bhi dikta, ganga ji bhi dikti hai, kal kal shabd bhi sunai deta hai. We could see everything, oh, oh swamis, we, a group of swamis were sitting around him. Oh swamis, I could see everything. I could see the river flowing past, I could hear the gurgling sound of the water. I could hear that. 
Then I ask the director of the, of the film crew, the TV crew, Sir, can you give me a glass of Ganga water from there? Can you, a glass Ganga Pani Diji, can you give me a glass of Ganga water from the river? And the director laughed and he said, Oh Swami, how is that possible? It just looks like that, it's not there. Dikta hai, hai nahi in Hindi, it's very powerful there. It looks like that, there's no reality to it. And then the Swami, I can never forget, he, looks, he looked very piercingly at us, you know, we were sitting at his feet. Oh Swamis, oh monks, look around you, there's towering peaks, glaciers running down, the forest, pine forests around and the river flowing at our feet. Look around, all this, it appears, there is no reality here. It is form, it is sound, it is smell, it is taste, it is touch. Instead of seeing a two-dimensional movie, a three-dimensional movie, you have this five-dimensional movie playing before consciousness. There is no reality there, there is no substance, nothing that will slake your thirst. There is a Tagore song. I think it's Dhananjay Bhattacharya's song. I, I've forgotten the uh, source. Anyway, the song goes like this, that sitting on the banks of the ocean of nectar, of an ocean of nectar, sitting on the banks of the ocean of nectar, they die of thirst, oh my Lord. They do not turn around and see. They scrabble in the hard sand trying to get a drop of water to quench their thirst. They die there on that sand. They do not look around to see the ocean of nectar behind them. That's us. He's talking about us. Struggling throughout life for a little bit of peace, a little bit of love, a little bit of lasting, you know, profound satisfaction in life. No. We are, we are trying to get water from sand. The reality is within us, is who we really are. It's an appearance. The universe appears in thee. It's an appearance, it's not real in itself. Technical point here before I go on. Definition of falsity in Advaita Vedanta. What is, how do you define what is false? That which borrows its reality from something else is false. It does not have reality of its own. Who is, it's, it's like saying, who is not truly rich? Looks rich, but is not rich. It means credit cards. You borrowed your wealth. I have borrowed my wealth from, from others. I look rich. I act rich. I buy rich. But I am not rich because it's all borrowed. So I am not truly rich. All that appears seems to exist. Its existence is drawn from Brahman, that infinite existence which you are. It's borrowed from the universe, borrows its existence from you and appears before you. Vivekananda says, things are dead in themselves, we breathe life into them, then either we chase them or we run away from them. It borrows its existence from us. That which has borrowed existence is defined as false. False is not non-existent. There is a difference between existent, false, non-existent. It's like this. It's a difference between telling the truth, telling a lie and keeping silent. Telling the truth is saying it as it is. That is the existence. That's compared to Brahman, the reality. On the other hand is not saying anything, keeping silent. That is non-existence, nothingness. But the false is neither of these. When somebody tells a lie, that person is actually speaking, is saying something, not keeping silent is saying something, but telling an untruth, telling it as, not as it is. Similarly, that which is false, the universe of appearance, is not non-existent. It is not truly existent like Brahman. It's a mixture of the two. It borrows its existence from Brahman and then plays out before us. So here is the point I want to make. A little bit of logic, borrowed from a philosopher, who lived 2000 years ago, Nagarjuna, the great philosopher of Shunyavada, the school of void, Buddhist voids. The logic goes like this. Hold on to the idea that the false, the appearance, 
the mithya, literally Sanskrit word mithya means false, is borrowed existence. Right? That which borrows existence is not either existent nor non-existent. That is the false. That which we cannot say it really exists. Brahman only really exists. That we cannot say it does not exist because it appears to us. How can you say it does not exist? It's not the truth. It's not silence. It's in between. You hear it, but it's not true. You see it, it does not exist. So that which you cannot say that it truly is, that which you cannot say that it is not, that mixture that neither exists, nor can you say it does not exist, that is the false. Hold on to that. Now the logic goes like this. When you say borrowed existence, in normal circumstances, borrowing something is very simple. I mean, um, who borrows? The person who does not have it. Follow this logic, it's very interesting. The person who does not have something will borrow. So who borrows money? A poor person borrows money. Who is a poor person who does not have money? Borrows money. So the poor person does not have money, borrows money. It's simple. But when it comes to existence, the thing becomes very interesting. The question is asked, what sort of entity can borrow existence? What sort of entity can borrow existence? The truly existent need not borrow existence because it exists. Brahman, God, the ultimate reality need not borrow existence because it exists. And that which does not exist, non-existent, cannot borrow reality because it doesn't exist. How can it borrow reality? Somebody who does, a non-existent man cannot borrow money. Similarly, a non-existent entity cannot borrow existence because it doesn't exist. What, how will it borrow anything at all? It cannot do anything. So that which borrows existence cannot be ultimately truly existent. It cannot be non-existent. It can only be neither truly existent nor, truly, nor non-existent in between. That is the definition of the false. It is only the false which borrows existence. Borrowing existence is called falsity. If that sounds very abstract, look at the snake which appears. The rope is mistaken as the snake. That snake, its existence, the momentary existence which you feel, there is a snake there, it borrows that momentary existence from the rope which is its reality. The world of appearance borrows existence from you, the ground of appearance. Mr. Eckhart, the great mystic, Christian mystic, Catholic mystic, he called God the ground of the universe. God is the ground of the universe, on, upon which the universe subsists and upon which it appears, but in which it really is not, Ashtavakra is saying. And that ground of the universe, you are. Not individually, that one reality, you are. That's your reality. Third one. What is what in one Sanskrit word, what shall we call it? Mithyatvam, falsity of the world, world, world experience. The world is an appearance. In what? In you, the reality. The fourth verse, the last one this evening, is a consequence of these three. Remember these three. Non-attachment, asangatvam. Ekatvam, oneness of the universe. You. Mithyatvam, the non-reality, the unreality, of the, the falsity of the universe which appears in you. First stage, you're completely detached from the entire universe of experience. First stage. Second stage, the entire universe of experience is in you. It's not different from you. Third stage, that which is in you, which appears in you, is really not in you. It's an appearance. Only that one existence consciousness bliss is, truly is. That's what you are. Knowing this, let this universe appear. Let the game go on. Let life go on. Birth and death, success and failure, all of them, let them come. Let the waves in the ocean roll on. That's the beauty of the ocean. The ocean is not afraid of the waves. The waves arise in the ocean, play in the ocean, disappear back into the ocean. Then what is the consequence? The last one, last verse. Sama dukkha sukha purna asha nairashya yo samaha sama jivita mrityusan 
व्रज Thou art infinite. You purna means you are whole, complete. You are complete in yourself, and therefore, sama dukha sukhas. In sorrow and in in pleasure, in in pain and in pleasure, thou art serene. Serene in play, pain and in pleasure. In hope and despair, alike serene. In death. and in life alike serene in this way dissolve into infinity the consequence of this will be this tremendous serenity that comes out you see serenity is not a quality of the mind it's the very nature of the self when you become aware of that the mind will become serene the mind you see dukkha if pain comes mind will experience pain but in the background of that will be an unchanging serenity when turiyananda asks ramakrishna when he was ramakrishna was suffering from cancer how are you today sir throat cancer a nasty form of cancer how are you today sir and sri ramakrishna says the cancer is there the, the, the pain is there i cannot eat anything it hurts and hari maharaj says to him apparently a cruel thing to say he says but i see you are in great bliss sounds cruel to say to a per- man dying of cancer and what does ramakrishna say he bursts out laughing and he says the rascal has caught me out Hari Maharaj himself later on in life when you're suffering in so many inc- incidents are there where they would perform operations on him he would say perform the operation without any chloroform without any anesthesia and he would sit, sit in peace absolutely serene serene in pain serene in pleasure pain is experienced vedanta is not a pain killer it will be experienced and you will experience this you will know the serenity beyond the pain the ser- the pain appears in the ocean it's a wave in the ocean which you are you experience it it's nothing to you at one point when he was suffering a lot in his old age uh, hari maharaj swami turiyananda was asked by a young monk are you suffering very much swami and the swami said it's the suffering of the body inside he says is in bengali in by the grace of thakur by the grace of sri ramakrishna he says the inside is a mass of ice I'm absolutely cool inside. That serenity cannot be disturbed. You cannot even if you try you cannot disturb it. It's always available to you. Serene in pain, serene in pleasure. Serene in hope, serene in despair. Your mind will register hope and despair as life goes on ups and downs of life. But all the time the background serenity will be there. It's available to you. The moment you see that you're absolutely calm. serene in hope and ser- serene in despair serene in life serene in death alike contemplate death death of the body there is no death for you you will once we get an insight into this the first thing which will become clear is we are immortal effortlessly show so you don't have to make yourself immortal yourself you need not make immortal the body you cannot make immortal body will get old degenerate die go back to nature ashes to ashes dust to dust that infinite ocean of awareness and bliss in which the body appeared that will continue exactly as it has always and that's what you are serene in life serene in death in this way uh, dissolve into infinity when not at death right now dissolve into infinity this individuality is dissolved into the infinite and from the infinite now you live the life this life is lived in infinity the whole book is like this just four four verses no wonder 
people are warned against this book. Be careful, it'll drive you crazy. Uh, questions? If you give it to the mind, it'll have a thousand questions. If you have questions, then Vedanta will say, step down from Ashtavakra, come to the, the Upanishads, the commentaries of Shankaracharya, the teachings of all the great sages and all that. It will take you step by step up to this. In Vedantic learning, there are, uh, the study of uh, Vedantic teaching, there are three stages. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana is to systematically hear the teachings from a teacher again and again. Manana is to reflect upon it. Give it to the mind, intellect. One must understand, not believe in it. One must understand this. Understand this clearly, see it clearly. Manana. And then when you have seen it clearly, when you have got confidence on the teaching, dwell upon it day and night for a long, long period of time. Soak yourself in it. This text is meant for soaking yourself in it. It's the final text. When you have studied it, when you know it, when you are more or less convinced about it, it just hammers it in again and again and again into you. Questions? Reactions? Yes? Sorry, I, I came late. What is the name of the book? And ah. That question Janaka asked uh, Stavokari. Yes. So what, was the, what is the book? It is the book. <laughs> Ashtavakra. Okay. Ashtavakra Sanghita. And the chapter is Dissolve into Infinity. Four ways of dissolving yourself into infinity. What is the first way? The first way or the first step, I, I would say, is, is non-attachment. Non-attachment not as a practice. You see, this non-attachment is perfectly compatible with the greatest attachment, with the most miserable kind of attachment also. It's perfectly compatible. It just tells you the real self which you are at this moment is completely non-attached. It is pure. There is nothing you can add to it by any kind of spiritual practice, moral practice, which will make it better. There is nothing that you need to get rid of to make it better. It's absolutely pure as it is. Dangerous teaching. The first reaction is to stop spiritual practices. <laughs> then you are going to get into serious trouble. Spiritual practices affect the mind. Just as physical yoga will affect the body, Meditation and prayer, prayer cleanses the heart. Meditation quietens the mind. You see, if you want happiness, if you want happiness, fall in love. Fall in love with God. Love of God is the highest happiness. You know, in this country especially, there is a culture of seeking happiness in a perfect romantic relationship. Doomed to failure in human relationships. But it's not false. The prototype is the relationship between the soul and the oversoul, between you and God. Fall in love with God. C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, he defines religion as falling in love with God. Fall in love with God, bhakti, it will give you happiness. You want peace of mind? Meditate. Hmm? Meditation, there are techniques of meditation which will give you deep peace of mind. You want the truth? <laughs> oh, Nitya Sarupananda. But there is another one, which is, I love it so much. Bairam, he's a professor of English in Oxford. Yes. yes. That book is a poetic rendition. See, the problem is, when um, a scholar of Sanskrit renders it into English, it's literal, it's precise, but it loses the power somehow in English. If you want to read it in English, A.S. Byram, um, what is it, Heart of Awareness? Heart, Heart, of Awareness. Heart of Awareness. I think it's available in the, I mean, it was a few months ago, I bought the last one which was available, but I think it, it, it'll be, you can, you can buy it. Just read it, it's beautiful. It's beautifully done. He was a professor of English in Oxford, uh, trained in Oxford, and he taught in uh, America also. I don't know if he's still alive. No, he, he died. Uh, he died young. Oh. Yeah. It's fantastic. It shows a mind which is illumined. To some extent, at least, this person knows the truth. Mm -hmm. And you should read it here, in the early mornings or afternoons, in the silence in Santa Barbara, sitting out there. Mm -hmm. 
looking at the ocean, the setting sun or the rising sun and the, and the greenery all around, read that. Each verse, almost every verse, most of the time I've seen the translation, there is an improvement on the translation here. It can throw you into, into, into deep meditation. Just the words, that you are the Atman, perfect, alone, serene. Just that. Sit with that. You're not trying to be perfect, trying to be alone, or trying to be serene. You are that already. You cannot change it also. You just have to recognize it. Questions? We still, we're almost out of time. We are out of time, I think. <laughs> but still, some reaction, questions? My question, Swami, is when are you coming back? <laughs> in July. Spoken to Mataji, she's a human age program here in China. Almost a month. In Santa Barbara. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> but she's a, she's quick on the. Um, so she, she's she's a reserve twice. You said. We hope. We hope I get it three times. As much as we can for one Sunday and probably at least two other days. Because I have to give Sundays to uh, Chabuco and to Hollywood also. How about your classes? We can do something in between then. Yeah. If you're interested. Yes. Tell me, how did this strike you? Peace. Deep. Profound. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uneasy. <laughs> no, nobody? There are people there. Is he uneasy? Uneasy? Yes. yes. <laughs> are we, do we have a sound? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is the song of Ashtavakri. Ashtavakri Gita is the song of Ashtavakri. Yes. Yes. Oh, this one was uh, that's been my favorite book for quite a while. Yes. It's my favorite book too. It's not the But uh, there's a scene there somewhere.